simple recipe, is it not? For instance, why are people on a roller coaster so happy when everything's so scary? Two reasons. One, people who enjoy roller coasters are insane. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Not really. One is that they do have confidence they're not going to die. It's just, it's just going to seem like it, but really they know the roller coaster's been safety tested and reviewed, and the chances are probably literally one in a million that they are going to die. In fact, I looked it up. Since this is a value add you people get. Since 2007, so in the past 17 years, of the millions and millions of people who've taken roller coaster rides, three have died due to the fault of the coaster itself. There have been other deaths almost always attributable, attributable to rider error. Oh no, I dropped my phone. When you're on a roller coaster, no matter how scary it gets, I'm told, you have confidence that it's safe and you're going to get back Safely. Paul had that confidence if you want to talk about a roller coaster life. <laughs> That's the first reason people on a roller coaster are so happy. They have confidence in the coaster itself. The second reason people on a roller coaster are happy is they're thankful. They waited in line for the ride. They paid money to be there, and they're thankful they're finally taking the ride. This is where they want it to be. So when you're thankful and you have confidence, you have the face of a roller coaster rider. <laughs> Joy. Sure, it seems dangerous. Sure, it seems scary. Sure, if it's your first time on that particular ride, there are going to be unknowns. But with confidence in the coaster and thankfulness that it's your turn to ride, you get joy. Again, I'm told. Weddings. Same thing. Two people are confident they're going to have a great marriage. And they're thankful they're getting married, so they're joyful. It's a powerful combination. Confidence, thankfulness, resulting in joy. And that's what Paul shows in these 11 verses. And really through the rest of the letter. So let's take a look at the background and setting for the writing of this letter to the church in Philippi to kick off our sermon series. Philippians is known as the epistle of joy. Joy is a major theme of Philippians, and we'll unpack that in the months to come. And what we'll see, I'm pretty sure, is that this joy is a product of thankfulness, which itself is a product of confidence. So it's really no coincidence that a letter characterized by joy would be bookended by thanksgivings. Joy and thanks go together, and the most thankful people tend, I'm sure by sheer coincidence, to be the most joyful people. So what was it about this church, these people, that brought forth such joy and thanks from the Apostle Paul? Well, in Philippians, Paul is writing to his strongest supporters. One scholar remarked that the church in Philippi appears to be the one that gave Paul the most satisfaction and the least trouble. If you read through Paul's letters, you find that a lot of the churches gave Paul endless headaches. But when he writes this letter to the church in Philippi, he's in Rome. What's he doing in Rome? Well, after he was imprisoned in Caesarea, he was sent to Felix, the Roman governor of that province, to hear his case. Felix didn't free him. The book of Acts says he was hoping Paul would bribe him. Paul didn't, so Felix left him in prison. And then when new governor Festus arrived, Paul appealed the sentence to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. So Festus sent Paul to Rome under guard. So now he's in Rome. He's waiting for Caesar to hear his case. He's under house arrest. Okay, this means he's not chained in a dungeon somewhere. That will come later for Paul. The church tradition is that Paul will be executed by beheading after his second Roman imprisonment. This is his first Roman imprisonment. So while he's in Rome, waiting for his case to come up to Caesar, he's under house arrest. This means he's living in his own accommodation at his own expense. 
He's not permitted to leave, but he can receive visitors. Acts 28 says that during this time, Paul, quote, welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. He's chained to a Roman guard. The guard changes three times a day. Paul is never allowed to be more than a chain length away from a Roman guard for about two years, which is how long he's waiting for his case to come up before Caesar. And being under house arrest, he can't do what he would normally be doing, which is going out among the people in the marketplace, the synagogues, wherever he can find a willing set of ears to share the gospel, to reason from the scriptures, and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. So he does the next best thing, he writes letters. Or more precisely, he dictates letters to his secretary. For these letters, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon are in the Bible today. And this kind of, I was listening to a podcast about Martin Luther this morning. This reminds me of after Martin Luther had kind of gotten the Reformation going. You know, there was all this hubbub, all this strife back and forth, and Luther was right at the middle of it. And then just after his big trial, Luther's riding away, and he's kidnapped by a friend, but he doesn't know this yet. And he's taken to a castle where he is basically held for three or four months. And it seems like a terrible thing, but for Luther, it was wonderful. It gave him a rest, and during that time, he translated the Bible into German. Never would have had time to do that if he hadn't been under virtual imprisonment. So when you hear that Paul's in prison, you see that he's making the best use of that time. And now this could have been about the year 60 to 62 AD. Paul had founded the churches in Ephesus and Philippi on earlier missionary journeys. He knows the people there. He had never visited Colossae, but he had heard about the church there. And, of course, Philemon was a personal friend of his. Now, for the church in Philippi, was about 10 years old. It had been started around the year 50 or 51, and it was the first church anybody had planted in Europe. And it was notably different from the other churches Paul had planted in that it was primarily a Gentile church, and women played prominent roles in the church. Philippi itself was in Greece. It was on a major trade route. You would pass through Philippi on your way to Rome. It was known for its gold mines, its abundant spring water. At one time, under Alexander the Great, it was actually the capital of the Greek Empire. So it was a city of some renown. Although it was in Greece, it did have a heavy Roman flavor because Philippi was used as a retirement place for Roman army veterans. When you signed up to be in the Roman legions, you were you know, promised your pay, and if you stayed in for 20 years, you were guaranteed to be given a plot of land somewhere. That was usually in Philippi. So the city had a distinctly Roman military character, which Jewish people would find very uncomfortable, to say the least. <laughs> as a matter of fact, when Paul first arrived in Philippi, having been directed there in a dream instead of going to the area which is now Istanbul, there was no synagogue in the city. So as it records in Acts 16, he went to the river. Since Paul knew that's where he would find Jews worshiping in a city with no synagogue. Jewish law said a synagogue should be established in a place where there were 10 men. That there was no synagogue in Philippi means the Jewish community there was insignificant. Indeed, there's very little archeological evidence that there was any Jewish community at all in Philippi during the time of Paul. Again, that there were so many ex-military men in Philippi meant the Jews had either left of their own accord or they'd simply been driven out. But down at the river that day, Paul met a very successful Gentile businesswoman, Lydia, who had accepted Judaism, and she became his first Christian European convert. Also in Philippi, Paul and Silas, his, Paul's traveling companion, cast a demon out of a slave girl, which resulted in them being thrown in prison. And then you might know the story from that point about midnight, Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praises to God, and earthquake destroys the prison, which was the opportunity for Paul to convert the Philippian jailer, who would have been an ex-military man. Jailer was a job given to retired military officers, and baptized him and his household. 
Paul and Silas spent about three months in Philippi, then made their way on to Thessalonica. Now, the church, 10 years later, at the time Paul is writing to them, is still a strong, healthy, successful church. Paul had visited it on a later missionary journey, and the church gave him a gift to take to the suffering Christians in Jerusalem during his imprisonment, of which uh, the, the, the time that he's writing, this church would also provide him with financial and prayer support. And even after the apostolic age, the church in Philippi continued on as a healthy church with the usual problems all churches have, of course, but as late as the year 110, the church father Polycarp was still writing letters to the churches in Philippi. So this is a very established, healthy church that Paul is writing to, which, believe me, makes pastors very joyful. <laughs> and the gentle tone in this letter to the Philippians is a joyful, confident thankfulness. The instigation for the letter, the immediate occasion for its writing, is to thank the church in Philippi for their gift. And the opening 11 verses, which we're going to look at today, is Paul thanking God for this church. In other words... The specific reading, the specific reason for Paul writing this letter to the church in Philippi is to thank them for a support gift they had sent him. Near the end of the letter in chapter 4, which we'll come to, he thanks them specifically for the gifts they sent, and being Paul, he uses that as an opportunity to teach them on how to use material resources God has given us. Also in chapter 4, Paul says, No church has been as generous to him as the Philippian church. And the letter was carried from Paul in Rome to Philippi by a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had been sent to Paul by the Philippian church. That would be like if we sent Brother Rudy to a church in Indonesia somewhere to help look after them, right? So now Paul was reuniting Epaphroditus with his home church. So Philippians is a much more pleasant letter to write for Paul than, say, Galatians or 1 Corinthians. And what does come through in this passage for today is a strong connection there is from confidence in God to a spirit of thankfulness to the abiding presence of joy. In fact, if I can sum up what these first 11 verses show us, I would say that Paul's confidence in God's work and his life and the lives of the Philippians, leads him to thanking God for them and for what God's doing. And this confident thankfulness almost inevitably generates great joy in Paul. In these first 11 verses, it's as if Paul can already see the Christians in Philippi as a finished work that we all are in the sight of God. And that vision causes him to burst forward in joyful thanks. So those are the three things I want to look at today. And as we continue through Paul's letter to the Philippian church, one, Paul's confidence in God, which leads to thankfulness, and this confident thankfulness results in great joy. Confidence, thankfulness, joy. So let's read these 11 verses again. Make sure you understand what's being said before we draw any conclusions. So, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, 
and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, the first thing we notice about this writing is it is a letter. It is a letter written in the standard format expected of first century Roman letters. The opening would identify the sender uh, back when we used to write letters. You would write, you know, like, dear John at first, and you would put your name at the end, love David, you know, whatever. Uh, that never made much sense to me. And the Romans, I think, did it the right way. The opening says, this is from David. <laughs> it identifies the sender, the recipient, and it includes a stylized greeting. Paul modifies the standard letter format a little bit, but he, he doesn't modify the style very much. He modifies more of the content. Any first century educated person would immediately recognize the style Paul's using as a customary way to write a letter, and I read all the differences, and I am not gonna get into the weeds this morning, just take my word for it, okay? <laughs> If you want to get into the weeds with that, I can give, give you a book. Um, but there are a couple things to point out. You'll notice in the first verse, Paul makes a point of saying that Timothy is with him and that they are, quote, servants of Christ Jesus. If you have a better translation, they would have translated that slave of Christ Jesus. Servant is kind of a euphemism. Now, we've been over the institution of slavery in the Roman Empire in the first century. No need to cover all that ground again. But just to say that everybody would have understood that the slave of an emperor or other high official had a lot more power than an independent free person did. Slaves were seen as agents acting on behalf of the emperor. So if the emperor's slave came to you and told you to do something, you don't say, oh, psh, you're just a slave. I don't have to listen to you. You say, yes, sir, right away, sir. So the original hearers of this letter would have understood perfectly what Paul was saying by identifying himself and Timothy as slaves of Christ Jesus. Not that they were you know, menial laborers in Jesus' kitchen or cotton field, but that what they said and wrote comes with the authority of Jesus himself. That's who it's from. It's addressed to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Now, we do know, do we not, that saint does not mean the Roman Catholic version of saint, which is, a, you know, saint, I don't know, Jerome, saint, you know, Richard, whatever. A spiritual superstar, someone whose works, Saint Ezra, you know, someone whose works are better than yours, Someone way higher and more holy than the rest of us schlubs. No, what the Bible means by saint, the Greek word hagioi, is simply anybody who's in Christ. All Christians are saints. You are all saints. Saint Ty. We are all holy. Holy just means set apart for, set apart for God. If you are a Christian, you are by definition set apart for God's own possession. You are holy. You are a saint. You are. So addressing a letter to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi is simply Paul saying to the Christians in Philippi or to the church in Philippi. Same thing. But at the end of verse 1, Paul does something kind of weird. He doesn't do this in any of his other letters. He includes in the list of who the letter is sent to, along with saints, you know, the church members, he includes the overseers and the deacons. The word overseer is episkopos in the Greek. Te technically, it means bishop. Okay. There are only two church offices mentioned in the New Testament, episkopos and diakonoi, elder and deacon. In this church, C U and I are the episkopos. So we would appreciate it if you start addressing us as bishop. <laughs> bishop C U. And Stephen is the hard-working diaconoid. Now, every church of any size in the first century would have had elders and deacons. Nobody's really sure why Paul includes them in this greeting. Hmm. He doesn't specifically mention them in any of his other epistles, although it's a certainty they existed in all the other churches he writes to. 
But this is Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No doubt there is a reason. I don't know, maybe it's an inside joke or something. We don't know. Shouldn't speculate. Okay. The rest of the passage, verses 3 to 11, are just five sentences. Verses 3 to 5 are one sentence. Verse 6 is one sentence. Verses 7 to 11 are three sentences. And as one excellent commentator, Alec Mortier, wrote, and I agree, the whole passage turns on verse 6. What Mortier meant, and I'm sure it's a source of tremendous relief to him that I agree with him, is that Paul can write with joy. He can write with thanksgiving, as he does, because of the confidence he expresses in verse 6. Verse 6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The reason Paul is so confident in the Philippian church, the reason he can thank God when he remembers them, is because he knows that it's all God's doing. Friend, as Alec Montier wrote, perfectly correctly, salvation would be a wretchedly unsure thing if it had no other foundation than my having chosen Christ. Reminds me of something John MacArthur said once. If it were possible for me to lose my salvation, I would lose it. Paul knows this. Paul knows this. See, Paul has zero faith in the ability of the wonderful people of Philippi to do what the rest of the passage says, to abound more and more in knowledge and discernment, for their love to abound more and more, for them to approve what is excellent, for them to be pure and blameless, for them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, or for them to bring glory and praise to God. This is impossible. Paul has no faith in the ability of anybody in Philippi to do any of that on their own, but in Christ. In Christ, yes. Paul has supreme confidence, supreme assurance that God will bring the Philippian believers to fulfill all that. Paul knows they have as much as already accomplished all that. And that is why Paul can be thankful. That is that's why Paul can be joyful when he thinks of his dear people in Philippi. Because it all rests on the solid rock of assurance, the confidence in the work of God in the lives of these believers. As verse 6 says, God himself has begun good work in them, and hey, what God starts, God finishes. Paul's confidence is not in the flesh. His confidence is in God's work. In us. And this is as true for any and all Christians, all you saints here in this room today. See, the style of writing frequently used by first century Jews was to put the main idea of a passage right in the middle. We tend to either put it at the beginning or the end. We tend to put the main idea as a topic sentence at the beginning and then demonstrate it, or at the end as a conclusion of what we've said. It was a Hebrew style to put it right in the middle. And verse 6 is right in the middle of this passage. As a matter of fact, in the very middle of the book of Philippians itself, is chapter 3, verse 12, where Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That is what gave Paul joy and thankfulness in his own life. Paul knew that whatever he had accomplished in his own life, it wasn't up to Paul. It wasn't up to the Saul of Tarsus guy. He had already seen what that guy was capable of apart from Christ. No. Paul could rest in joyful thankfulness because God had made Paul his own in Christ Jesus. And that gave Paul the confidence that only comes from knowing that God's on the job, that God guarantees the work. Well, you might say, that sounds great. But I'm the one who has to go out there and live every day. I make decisions. I make choices. I have free will. God's not controlling me like a robot. I'm not a puppet on God's strings. No, of course not. Free will is a huge subject we're not going to get into right now. 
we're not predestined to this morning, so we won't. No, what Paul means in verse 6, the confidence he gets is that he knows God has promised to complete the work he's begun in all believers in Christ. Remember, during the same imprisonment that Paul's writing this to the Philippians, he's writing another letter to the church in Ephesus. Let's take a quick look at the kind of thing Paul's writing to them. This is Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 16. Paul writes, excuse me. Paul writes, In him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believe in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, Paul writes, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And of course, Paul's not saying that's true of just the people in Ephesus. That's also true of the people in Philippi. It's true of you here today if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You have the same confidence Paul did. And the reason for that is the assurance of what God has promised to do, what God has done, what God is currently doing, and what God will do. Paul says, verse 6, chapter 1 of Philippians, that he's sure God will finish what God started in the Philippian believers, and because he has that confidence, he can thank God as if it's already done. And thinking of what the people will be once God is done with them, they will be abounding in love. They will be abounding in knowledge and discernment. They will be approving what is excellent. They will be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. They will be filled with the food of righteousness. They will be bringing God praise and glory. Paul can thank God for this as if it's already done because Paul knows if God's promised to do it, it is already done. This fills him with joy, and the joy drives him back to more thankfulness. Okay, so that's how we can have confidence. God has promised to finish his work in us. And in the others sitting around you, bear in mind. It's like if you're in an art studio, you're to have your portrait painted, you walk in, you see a blank canvas on an easel, the artist walks up to the canvas, and it starts you know, dabbing some paint here and there, Frankly, it doesn't look like much. It looks like a canvas with some dabs of paint here and there. It doesn't look anything like you at all. In fact, you can't even tell what it's supposed to be. It doesn't look beautiful. It looks confused. It looks random. You can't see any design. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just some colored blobs. So you ask the artist, hey, uh, what's your name again, buddy? Oh, sorry, Rembrandt Van Ryn. Nice to meet you. Ah. Uh, Mr. Van Ryn, are you sure you know what you're doing here? He looks at you and says, I'll be done in a week. You can come back then and see the finished portrait then. Well, you come back in a week and you're shocked, speechless, at the beauty, the precision, the absolute perfection of the composition, the exquisite use of color, mathematically perfect perspectives. You never could have dreamed of this from the blobs of paint you saw at first. You're simply blown away with the perfection of the painting, the rightness of every detail. One detail out of place would have ruined the whole thing, but he got it perfect. So a friend of yours wants her portrait painted, so you tell her, you know, I've got a name for you. <laughs> I mean, if Hannah's busy, just hire this Rembrandt Van Ryn guy. He knows what he's doing. Well, if, the, if that's a confidence you can have in a human painter, imagine confidence you can have that God is going to complete you, his work of art, in the best way possible. Such confidence leads straight to thankfulness. It is impossible to overstate the importance of thankfulness to a healthy life, especially a healthy Christian life. Two psychologists, Dr. Robert Emmons of the University of California, Davis, 
and Dr. Michael McCulloch of the University of Miami have concentrated their professional research on the subject of gratitude. Gratitude. In one study, according to Harvard Health Publishing, they asked all participants to write a few sentences each week around an assigned topic. The first group was told to write about events that had affected them in some way. They weren't told to write about negative things, positive things, just whatever came to mind. The second group was told to write about the daily irritations or things that had displeased them. The third group was told specifically to write only about things they were grateful for that had occurred during the week. After 10 weeks, the researchers found that the third group, those who wrote about gratitude, were more optimistic and felt better about their lives than the other two groups. If you want to put it in our terms, their increased thankfulness led to increased joy in their life. Surprisingly, Harvard Health notes, they also exercised more <laughs> and had fewer visits to the physicians than those who focused on sources of aggravation. These results shock nobody who studies the psychological effects of gratitude. Dr. Martin Seligman, probably the premier research psychologist for gratitude at the University of Pennsylvania, conducted a famous study on the impact of positive interventions on over 400 subjects, okay? He had them write about early memories according to a different subject each week. Now, when the week's assignment was to write and personally deliver a letter of gratitude to someone who had never been properly thanked for his or her kindnesses, the study found that participants immediately exhibited a huge increase in happiness. The impact, Dr. Selman found, was far greater than from any other intervention. Benefits lasted at least a month. One letter. But thankfulness and gratitude do not come naturally to most people, he said from experience. They certainly don't come easy in our culture, do they? Maybe this is why we see so little real joy in our culture. The vast majority of news is what? Happy, good things? Of course not. It's based on trying to get us fearful. It always pushes uncertainty. What we see on social media often leaves us with a negative state of mind. It seems that everybody else on Facebook or X or Instagram has a perfect life except us. This does not promote thankfulness, folks. <laughs> in today's culture, we're so bombarded with things to worry about, things to be uncertain and fearful of, things to get angry about, things to depress us, other lives to be envious of, it's easy to develop a general negative attitude. In fact, Patty Sinelli, health and fitness practitioner and journalist, cites research from America's National Science Foundation, finding that around 80% of our thoughts in a day are negative, 80%. That's in America, maybe it's better here, I don't know. Is it any wonder we're so depressed as a society? But we can cultivate habits of thankfulness. That's what the Apostle Paul learned to do. Just given the bare facts of Paul's career as an apostle, you would not find that a recipe for deep joy and thankfulness. Listen to him give his ministry CV in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says he has had, and I quote, far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Does this sound like you at work? Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is a daily pressure of me, of my anxiety for all the churches. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. This was, this was Paul's regular life. <laughs> 
Hey, imagine if that's how you'd summed up the last few years at your job. Now imagine you're a career counselor. <laughs> Would you say, Paul, you might want to change employers here. <laughs> Does this sound like a guy who's going to write with such confidence about joy and thanksgiving? But you cannot read for long in any of his New Testament writings before you find him breaking out in joy, joyful thanks to God, and encouraging others to be grateful. Mainly grateful that you're not Paul, I guess. In Colossians 3, 16 to 17, also written during this house arrest in Rome, Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, very famous passage. Paul instructs the church to rejoice when? Always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And these verses simply continue the theme of thankfulness all through the Bible. The Psalms are rich in thankfulness. Even Job, <laughs> with everything that happened to him through no fault of his own, is a model of thankfulness. And of course, when we were going through James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we saw, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, how can you have that kind of thankful, joyful attitude toward the trials in your life? Only if you have confidence that it's all under the control of an all-powerful, all-loving God who has promised that what he allows to happen to you is always only for your best. Confidence. Thankfulness. And then joy. Do you want to be joyful? Really? That sounded so encouraging. Do you want the joy that Paul has here? That we're going to see again and again as we go through Philippians? You should, because the Bible commands that you should. Let me read 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 again. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In Greek, that's known as a you do this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The will of God is for you to give thanks. As David Mathis writes on John Piper's great Desiring God website, as far as God's concerned, joy is not optional. You are to rejoice. It's pretty much a direct command. The Psalms are full of commands to rejoice, far too many to count here. Jesus commands us to rejoice in Matthew 5, 12. He says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. In Luke 10, Jesus says, rejoice, that your names are written in heaven. In Romans 12, the Bible says, rejoice in hope. 2 Corinthians 13 commands, finally, brothers, rejoice. And in the book of Philippians itself, goodness sakes, it has what one commentator has called a tidal wave of orders to rejoice. And one thing all these commands have in common is they're commanding the result of confidence and thankfulness. They're not telling you to just sit around and just work up feelings of happiness. Oh, I feel so joyful, don't I? You know? God's not telling you now, I'm watching you. If I don't see you smiling, you're in trouble. No. In every instance, God's telling you, be joyful because of what you know. Be joyful based on the confidence you have. Be joyful because of the assurances God's given you. The proper response to everything God has given you is joy. Some of you probably don't feel too joyful here this morning. I'm with you. I've heard from a great many of you now that you have pretty good reasons for not feeling pretty joyful right now. Sickness, family issues, job issues, money issues, age issues. I know that practically everybody here now is dealing with something that just drains the joy right out of a life. I also know that everyone who's in Christ 
everyone who's a saint, everyone here today in Christ, has an inexhaustible list of things to be thankful for. And I know that all of us Christians have the assurance that no one else in the world has. Does it always feel that way? Heck no, of course not. I mean, I can study the confidence we have in Christ. I can, you know, know it to be 100% true. I can sit down and write a sermon on joy when I'm feeling terrible. Many years ago, a missionary friend of mine and I were having lunch. Neither of us are what you would call, you know, bubbly, happy, cheerful guys. Uh, he's Scottish. I don't know what my excuse was. But I asked him, Derek, what's this joy that we Christians are supposed to have? I don't feel joyful all the time. I don't, you know, walk on, hey, I'm a Christian. He thought about it, and he said, no. But imagine how you would feel if you were not a Christian. If you had no assurances, no confidence in anything but yourself. I mean, we've heard, we're probably tired of hearing that love isn't a feeling, love is something you do. Maybe joy is not a feeling either, at least not an immediate one. Maybe joy is a quiet confidence we Christians have that keeps us from ever getting too depressed or too despondent over life. It sounds strange to say we need to work at joy. It sounds strange to say we need to work at love, doesn't it? But it's our choice to focus on our problems to focus on what's wrong, what's unknown, what better things other people have. We can do that. We can do that. Just go on Facebook. That's what everybody else is doing. I mean, if we're trying to walk on water, we can look at Christ and walk on water, or we can focus on the waves and sink. So I guess my first question would be, well, how much do we know? How can we have this deep, unshakable confidence in what God has promised and who God is as revealed in the Bible if we don't really study the Bible? What if we were to continually study the Bible to become more assured and more confident in the promises God has given us? What if we were to make an effort to every day write down things we're thankful for? Not just for one day, but let's say six months. Micah says we wouldn't need to worry about joy. Paul doesn't worry about joy. Paul doesn't worry about trying to work up joyful feelings. As we saw earlier, his joy, which kept him through all the terrible things that happened to him serving the Lord, was a product of his confidence in the Lord, reinforced by his continual thanksgiving. Paul says, verse 3, he gives thanks in his every prayer for the Philippians. Frankly, when you read the passage for today, these 11 verses, it's hard to tell where confidence, thanksgiving, or joy start and the other one stops. It's practically impossible to imagine having two of those things and not having the third one also. It sounds like they're all connected. Because they are. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the book of Philippians, uh, for what we're going to see from it. I pray that we will all keep in mind the confidence that we do have in you, Strive to th thank you and just let the joy follow. Amen.